What's going on, everyone, and welcome to Movie Emporium's TV review of Lovecraft Country Season 1, Episode 8, Jigabobo. Uh, before we begin, hey, if you like my channel, cool, hit the subscribe button and join Movie Emporium. Hit that notification bell, top to final is coming next. If you like any of these videos, cool, hit the like button as well as commenting below on any video to watch, including this one. Boy, oh boy, what an episode. Um, this is one of the best episodes of the season. I'm going to say it right now. Uh, everything about this episode was on point. It was poignant. It was exciting. And that ending to that ep this episode was insane. Um, I still think the one with Jamie Chung as Jiha, that episode, um, is the best episode of the season. I don't think it's going to be hard to really compare a complete to that or compete to that. But this episode deals with a lot of racism stuff that has been running throughout this entire season, but really comes into effect. Um, we have these characters who are African-American, who are having to deal with the police force, and the captain of the police force knows magic. And so, therefore, one of the first things that happens in this episode is we have um, a young girl, Dee Dee, Diane, however you want to call her. Um, she runs away because uh, Bobo was unfortunately uh, murdered, and there's a big procession. It's really hot out. Uh, they use uh, uh, the summer song that's in Karate Kid in, the, in this in this episode, which I thought was kind of interesting. And she ends up just kind of wandering through the town, and she does a couple rocks with the you know a couple young girls who are celebrating or just having fun, and uh, she ends up uh, being basically forced uh, into a demonic spell by the captain of the city, and what ends up happening is a very Jordan Peele. Um, a situation where we see two girls who are part of the Uncle Tom's cabin. And this is something straight out of like us. If you've seen us, you know what I'm talking about. These two girls that I'm showing you a picture of right now are creepy. The way they dance around, the way they act, facial movements. Like they, one of them has like really crazy claws. And kind of like the movie they follow, uh, they are constantly on her tail and just the way these young girls are like kind of the way they're dressed and the way they're bloodied, you know, they are demonic and stuff like that. And the way they like move and dance and they're like playful. They're like the two dead girls from, you know, the shining, but they're more demonic and monstrous and evil. And it's just, they're creepy. You know, I can see why it just makes you uncomfortable, but it's a very, very bold aesthetic, a very bold visual because they look like two girls that would have been like lynched or something like that back in the days of slavery so it's a very bold looking looking visual that really plays well to the the things at hand the things that we're seeing throughout this entire series and it's a really interesting revelation that Dee Dee or uh, diane or whatever you want to call her uh she goes to the ca the captain's office and she's like you know apparently these have they have had conversations before him her and the captain which i thought was kind of interesting but i just I found the dynamic of what is happening to, you know, Dee Dee Diane to be fascinating, unique, horrifying. She's constantly on the move. Um, she ends up at, you know, her um, uncle uh, Montrose's shop or whatever, or George's shop or whatever. And um, she is, like, trying to fight off these creatures and stuff like that. And, you know, she ends up getting, like, this big paw or this big, like, stuck bleeding in her hand. Because, of course, the, uh, Michael K. Williams character can't see these you know, invisible entities. But her hand becomes disformed and disfigured. It's insane. It really is. And it's a really, like, disturbing... You know, it's, it, it plays throughout the entire movie or the entire episode. But it is disturbing. It is dark. It is creepy. And you feel bad. You, you feel bad for her character. You feel bad for Diana for what she's having to go through. So it's it's powerful. Those two girls are disturbing to watch. But uh, Misha Green, who is one of the co-creators of this series... I th she was the director of this episode. I really think she does a really nice job to get this story moving forward, getting us close to the last two episodes to the conclusion of this season. Or I don't know if there's even going to be a second season, but I hope there is. And it's yeah, it's it's really it was really fascinating to watch. Jamie Chung's Jiha pops up in this episode very briefly for some weird reason. I don't know if she's going to appear later on. I don't know. It's not really. Not really giving much thought, but she pops up, and of course her and Letty have conversations. Letty and Atticus have fight, and Atticus is going to, basically, as we learn that when he went through the portal, he was 
push forward in time where he learns that he has a son. So the George Freeman on the book cover of Lovecraft Country in the book was his son. And he's reading it. And apparently the book is their life in different forms of fashions. And it's kind of like... It's not as close to what they're dealing with now, but there's like, you know, bits and pieces of, for instance, you know, um, uh, Ruby Baptiste is a man, which is really fascinating because George is learning about Ruby Baptiste and stuff like that, writing it in the book. And this it causes him and his father Montrose to kind of gain a semblance of a relationship. And it's really kind of fascinating to learn that Hippolyta is still gone. Nobody knows where she's at. Nobody can figure it out because the machine's broken uh Atticus gives a key to Christina to start up the machine because apparently we learned finally that Christina wants to live forever there's more to it I'm sure but she wants to live forever because uh Letty gives her the negatives to her father's uh book or whatever that they get in the I think episode four or something like that or whatever but the other thing that comes out of this situation is Atticus knows he's going to die which is what Jiha was trying to warn him about you know we learned that jiha is a succubus succubus that you know she needs she finally is the revelation of what she is is given to of course atticus and he wants to perform magic to basically uh, protect his people protect the you know his family and stuff like that which plays into the very end of this episode so her, him and Montrose do their thing they try to cast a spell which doesn't feel like it works uh christina gives him uh, like a barrier so it protects him when the spell works and stuff like that so it's a really kind of it's really interesting movement for this series from where it's you know began to where it is now so uh but letty like i said letty is dealing with ruby baptiste finally explains to what's going on you know letty tries to explain to ruby baptiste that she, uh, christina is using her christina is like a mastermind from what i'm gathering and she is using everything in her power to manipulate the world around her so all these characters are being manipulated so that christina can have her in um immortality and stuff like that but you know ruby baptiste is an interesting character in this episode because like i said when her episode that was kind of revolving her and of course christina she's like i said she explains everything to letty and then she and christina have a really heart-to-heart -heart moment where i know i'm like all over the place but letty i'll keep going back into the letty and atticus stuff like that but christina and of course uh, ruby baptiste have a moment where Ruby is really upset about this young kid who's been killed. You know, it's very much the 50s and 60s. So lynchings and murders of, you know, young black kids or young or adult black people and stuff like that is really a powerful stance and a powerful kind of motivation for somebody to want to be do something. It's very prescient with today's society. So we get that situation and then there before this happens, there's a really disturbing sex scene, which I'm not gonna put any pictures on because I'm trying to keep this family safe as much as I can, that involves basically the Christina turning into William. And then we have, of course, you know, Ruby Baptiste turning into the, you know, the white lady. They're having sex. And all of a sudden, like, Ruby Baptiste starts, like, all the shedding her skin and stuff like that. It's really disgusting. But it shows, like, the insane nature of this relationship that, you know, Ruby Baptiste can say... Christina's actually very poignant in that segment where you don't want to... You don't want to... You want to be a white person. You want to be somebody that is looked upon as, you know... Uh, in, a, in a circle so like that and ruby baptiste tries to explain no i'm not but as we learn later on christina offers money to a couple some white guys or whatever and she ends up getting beat and shot and basically uh killed and she had put a spell on her to basically bring her back to life but you see her start crying and stuff like that which i think is kind of a interesting point through the whole wraparound of Ruby Baptiste and Christina, where I think she realizes that whole idea and how much violent and how disturbing it was for, you know, that young poor black kid that gets killed. So I don't know if she'll really learn anything, but I think of maybe her seeing how truly awful it really is, is really a, a powerful thing. So we'll see what happens in the next episode, which is going to be really fascinating. So... This leads to kind of the final part of this episode where Christina and Letty have a conversation in a church. Letty is praying to God um, and Christina basically offers her um, invulnerability, a magic spell. And at first you're like, why give her invulnerability? What is the point? What is the logic? 
Uh, we learn that Letty is, of course, pregnant with George, or as she doesn't. She she tells Ruby Batista she's pregnant, so they both know her and Atticus know that they're she's pregnant, but they don't each know that they each know. You know, it's that whole friend segment, whatever. But um, so Christina gives uh, Letty an invulnerability spell. It's like we see this marking on her like stomach right here. And what's fascinating is her and Ruby Baptiste have are talking, and they're down in the cellar where she, uh, you know, Letty's getting pictures taken and stuff like that. And there's knock on the door, and the police are there, including the captain of the, you know, the guard and stuff like that. And she learns, of course, that the captain who's trying to enter can't enter because of the spell that's been put on the door. That if you know magic, you can't enter the thing. And of course, the cops, a bunch of them, start shooting up the house. Okay, um, that's where the invulnerability comes in because all of a sudden Letty stands up and she is not being shot at. She, there's no effects on her, no bullet holes. The bullets are actually going by her and stuff like that. Um, it's a really disturbing scene in the fact that it deals with the whole racial issue, racial tension. You know, she bought this house in the middle of a white neighborhood and stuff like that. And they're basically shooting up the house. People, there are people, transients, they're in here. They're probably dead. And, you know, people have been killed. And, uh, yeah, it's really depressing to watch. It really is. It's sad. It's heartbreaking. But it leads into the final confrontation, which is the WTF moment, which is what happens in every single episode of the series. There's that one WTF moment. Atticus hears gunshots, okay? Atticus hears the gunshots coming from the house. He runs over and he sees a ton of police shooting at the house. Letty sees him, Atticus, through the window. Police see Atticus and they point their guns at Atticus. Letty freaks out. She runs out the door. And as soon as one of the cops fires a bullet, the spell that Montrose and Atticus had thought didn't work actually worked. And a demon of only Lovecraftian nature could have pops out of the ground and starts viciously attacking all the police force it was a moment i was not expecting it was a moment that i got pure giddiness i got goosebumps and it's one of those moments that truly uh cements how good this series can be um truly cements how powerful this series can be because it's a series of racial inequalities it's a series of sci-fi demons it's a series about people being pitted against one another the nature of white versus black and so on and so forth so to see these creatures you know i don't want to see anybody kill it's not i'm not giddy about the fact they were killed it was just it felt like it's such a redemptive moment that it really true like it felt like, like really truly felt like a powerful thing but you see all these the you see all these cops being impaled and thrown and cop cars are being exploded i'm sure this is a very expensive shot that they shot this episode in and uh, it leads to the demon coming close to Atticus and Letty, but we realize that the spell worked and the demon is actually uh, in control from Atticus. So Atticus actually puts his hand up and that's the end of the episode. She's like, holy crap, it worked. And uh, yeah, it's it was, it was a pretty incredible moment. It was up there as one of the top moments of the actual series so far and was a showstopper it was it was a moment that is going to stick with me because as many moments you know we already had one moment with the whole sex scene in the beginning of this episode which was insane and then the succubus thing and all that good stuff but this episode was incredible it was powerful it was moving it was dark disturbing it was horrifying it was everything that i've been hoping for this series to continue with and this is the best or one of the best TV shows of the year, period. It, you know, even if the penultimate episode isn't as great, even if the series finale or season finale, whatever they're going towards, isn't great, this episode is cemented as a true revelation of how good Misha Green, Jordan Peele, and to an extent J.J. Abrams, and how much effort, blood, sweat, and tears they put into the series and you cannot not be just in awe of like how good the actors are in this series the writing is strong the script the directing you know like i said this is directed by misha green who's one of the co-creators um it's it's amazing so this is a 10 out of 10 um one of the best episodes of the season and you look at the title of the episode as well is a very poignant very 
uncomfortable th- it's not really an uncomfortable thing to say but it's a very poignant of what this episode is trying to do would the episode be called being called jigabobo because if you take out the bow you get you know what you get so that's a very poignant and very uh, it fits the episode perfectly just because bobo was the person that was killed and stuff like that so um yeah that'll do it that'll be my take on lovecraft country season one episode eight jigabobo uh, anyways, let me know in the comments below what you thought of the episode. Did you like it? Did you not like it? You know, if you didn't like the episode, perfectly all right. Tell me why you didn't like it, all that good stuff. But otherwise, you know, hit that subscribe button to join Movie Emporium. Hit that notification bell at the top to find out what's coming next. Hey, if you like any of these episodes, cool. Hit the like button, and uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Peace out.